So this is, uh, as Ian mentioned, this work is a few years uh, uh, from a few years ago. And, uh, but uh, I still like it as much uh, as when we discovered this set of results. And so when he asked me to talk about these results, I said, sure, why not? Um, so this is joint work with my former PhD students, Sefer Asadi and Yu Chen, both of whom uh, are here. Uh, I don't think I've ever uttered this sentence before, uh, joint work with the, my former PhD students. Okay. So, so that's nice. Um, okay. So just a quick reminder of, uh, I'm going to talk about graph coloring. And so the goal in the graph coloring problem is to color a given graph using the smallest possible number of colors. And what the coloring has to ensure is that there are no monochromatic edges. Okay? So for every edge, its endpoints should receive uh, distinct colors. Okay? So here you see an example of a four coloring of a graph. So it's a central problem um, in theoretical computer science and has many applications and, and has a very long and rich history. But it's also known at this point um, that this problem is uh, computationally very hard to optimize. And in particular, it's known that uh, for any epsilon greater than zero, it's NP hard to approximate the smallest number of colors to within a factor of n to the one minus epsilon. So in many applications, uh, as a result, we instead focus on um, coloring in terms of some more tractable graph parameter. And, uh, and usually, smaller the parameter, smaller the number of colors you would need. Okay? So perhaps one of the most well-studied examples of this kind of approach is uh, what's called the delta plus one coloring problem. And here, delta denotes the maximum vertex degree in the graph. So here is a simple um, fact that uh, uh, most of us already know. And uh, any graph can be always colored with delta plus one colors. And moreover, this can be done by a very simple greedy strategy. Okay? Just go over the vertices of the graph one by one. When you are at some vertex v, assign it one of the colors that has not yet been used in its neighborhood. Okay? That will always be possible because maximum degree is delta and you have delta plus one color. Okay? So this is a simple um, linear time uh, algorithm for solving delta plus one coloring problem. And I should just note that the delta plus one color bound you know, um, is not always tight, but there are graphs where this is in fact the best possible uh, bound on the chromatic number, which is cliques and odd cycles. Okay, okay so the motivating question for this talk is uh, can a delta plus one coloring be found by a sublinear algorithm? Okay. So let me explain um, what we mean by a sublinear algorithm in this context. Uh, uh, sublinear here would mean sublinear in the number of edges in the input graph. Okay. So the solution to the coloring problem itself is of size n because you have to assign a color to every vertex. Okay? So whenever I'll say sublinear from here on, it will be sublinear in the number of edges. Okay? So as a concrete uh, question, you can think about, uh, is it possible to delta plus one color a graph without looking at most of its edges? Okay? So that would be an example of a sublinear time algorithm. Okay? And already you can kind of uh, appreciate a little bit the challenge in uh, achieving the sublinear goal because the coloring has to ensure there are no monochromatic edges. And if you never looked at some of the edges in the graph, you never learned about them, how could you end up ensuring that you are outputting a valid coloring? Okay? And our goal here will be always to output a valid solution. Okay, so uh, we are going to look at this question um, from the perspective of uh, three computational resources, and which are going to be uh, space, time, and uh, communication. And so let me just spend a couple of minutes telling you about the computational platforms in which we are going to consider these resources. Okay. So when the resource of interest is time, we will work with the query model of computation, which you heard about uh, yesterday. 
Um, it was uh, talked, for example, so he talked about uh, the matching problem in this model. So here the access to the input graph is given to you by way of three kinds of queries. And uh, you could ask degree of any vertex. You could ask for any pair UV of vertices whether or not there is an edge between them. And then you can also ask what's called neighbor queries for any vertex V. You can give me an integer K and ask me to tell you name of the kth vertex in the adjacency list of vertex V. Okay. And again, the goal will be to design algorithms which compute by performing only a few queries. Okay, so they're not going to end up looking at most of the graph. Okay. And here I'm focusing on queries, but I am called, titling the slide to be sublinear time. The algorithms we'll end up designing, they will also pay attention to time needed to compute the solution. Okay, in the context of sublinear space, um, we will work with the streaming model of computation, which you also learned about yesterday. So here the graph, input graph is going to be revealed to you as a stream of edges. And uh, the algorithm will see these edges pass by, but it has only a small amount of memory to store information about these edges as they are passing by. Much smaller than the total number of edges. And the key point in this model to remember is that the algorithm will no longer have access, uh, random access to the input graph, okay? So once an edge has passed by, if you decided not to remember anything about this edge, then um, it's basically too late, okay? You cannot go back and look at this edge. Okay? So goal here will be to design algorithms which uh, have a working space that's much smaller than the size of the input graph. And finally, when the resource of interest is communication, we are going to work with the MPC model of uh, computation. And uh, so here, the edges of the graph are partitioned across multiple machines. And each machine has uh, a small amount of memory, much smaller than the size of the input graph, okay? So no machine is in a position to aggregate and store the entire graph so that you can just trivially solve the problem by aggregation. The computation in this model, yeah. So when the input is partitioned like this, in many problems it's reasonable to assume that the entities are partitioned randomly. So can there be taken any advantage? Uh, we will see, we won't need that assumption. Yeah, so here we'll assume uh, it's adversarial. Okay? But it's true that, uh, you know, that can uh, help. But you can usually simulate uh, that kind of uh, partition by throwing in an additional round where you kind of try to randomly redistribute the data. Okay. okay, so the computation proceeds in rounds, and, uh, and in each round, machines can send and receive messages from any other machine, but the constraint is going to be the total amount of uh, communication a machine participates in in a round is upper bounded by the memory of the machine, okay? So the amount of communication is not arbitrary. So once again, no machine is in a position in one round of communication to just simply learn uh, about the entire input graph, okay? And the goal is to compute um, uh, in small number of rounds of computation. Okay, so let's return um, to our motivating question. So can delta plus one coloring be found by a sublinear algorithm in any of these three models of computation. Okay. So in the uh, query model, the challenge would be to do so without looking at most of the, the graph. In the streaming model, the challenge would be to do so without storing information about most of the graph. And in the MPC model, the challenge would be to do so, do so without communicating information about most of the edges in the graph to other machines. Okay. So before I, uh, go any further, it's uh, worth um, <clears throat> highlighting uh, two reasons to be a priori somewhat um, <clears throat> uh, pessimistic about uh, this goal. And uh, so the first reason is somewhat philosoph uh, philosophical. Um, sublinear algorithms usually um, tend to gain efficiency by giving up on the goal of exact solution and settling in for a suitable approximation. And it may be a very good approximation to what you're looking for, but you usually end up giving up on 
the demand for an exact solution. Here, we do require, we do want that whenever the algorithm outputs a coloring, it's a valid coloring. There are no monochromatic edges, okay? And the second reason is a bit more concrete. Um, there are closely related problems uh, for which um, uh, you could rule out uh, any possibility of sublinear algorithms in at least some of these models, okay? So for example, uh, for the maximal independent set problem in the streaming setting, uh, you can show that uh, any algorithm requires omega n squared space. And similarly for uh, the maximal matching problem, any query algorithm to compute a maximal matching requires omega n squared time. Okay? So what's the connection with delta plus one coloring? Well, the connection is that uh, both these problems admit have a very simple greedy algorithm, very much uh, as in the spirit of the delta plus one coloring greedy algorithm that I uh, mentioned a few slides ago. Okay. okay, but these reasons notwithstanding, um, we can show actually um, for delta plus one coloring, it is indeed possible uh, to get highly efficient um, sublinear algorithms in all three models of computation. And, uh, and these algorithms are going to be randomized algorithms that are going to behave as follows. They will always output, um, you know, whenever the algorithm says I succeed, and which it will with the high probability, it will output a valid delta plus one coloring. But when it doesn't succeed, it will recognize this fact and output fail, okay? So it will never output uh, uh, invalid coloring. So let's look at these results uh, in a bit more detail. So um, first in the context of uh, streaming algorithms, uh, we show that there is a, a essentially um, n polylog n space uh, streaming algorithm uh, for solving this problem. And, uh, and just uh, uh, let's remind ourselves again, you need omega and space just to store the solution. Okay? So it's using space, which is just a little bit more than the space you need to store the solution. Okay? And uh, prior to this work, uh, the best known algorithm uh, did need order n squared space when if delta was close to uh, omega n, then the space requirement of any previous known algorithm was in fact n squared. And one other uh, nice feature of this result is that even though I motivated the problem uh, in the setting of what's called insertion-only streams, a graph is being revealed to you uh, by sequence of edge insertions, the uh, algorithm we designed works in a stronger setting uh, of dynamic streams where the stream consists of edge insertions and deletions. So in the setting of uh, sublinear time, uh, we can show that there is an algorithm uh, for delta plus one coloring that um, essentially takes uh, no more than um, uh, order n to the 1.5 times. And moreover, this is essentially optimal up to polylog factors. Um, this problem does require omega n to the 1.5 queries okay, to solve in the worst case. And here, uh, I want to highlight uh, two things. One, the algorithm that we designed here, which runs in order n to the 1.5 time, the queries that the algorithm is going to perform are chosen non-adaptively, okay? So it's a one-shot collection of queries that the algorithm performs, and then uh, uh, we get the result. Okay? In contrast, the lower bound actually holds for adaptive algorithms. So even if I allow the algorithm to be adaptive, you can't go below this n to the 1.5 barrier. And finally, for um, the MPC model of uh, computation, we can show that there is a constant round MPC algorithm uh, for delta plus one coloring when each machine is allowed n polylog n memory. If we assume public randomness, then in fact the algorithm will run in only one round. Okay. Um, and so prior to this work, um, the best known algorithms all required super constant uh, number of rounds. 
Uh, so uh, this is the first constant round algorithm for this problem in the MPC model. Okay, okay so yeah. Yes, it, 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 no machine can receive uh, communication which exceeds its memory, which is n poly log n. Yeah. Are there stronger deterministic lower bounds? <coughs> okay. Uh, uh, so I, I, I will say something about it uh, maybe towards the end. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so how do we design these uh, sublinear algorithms? Um, all three results are going to follow from a sparsification theorem that we develop, um, which in some sense is the central um, uh, idea um, in our work. So what is this uh, sparsification theorem? Um, so we'll call this uh, palette sparsification theorem, and the theorem says the following. Suppose each vertex in your input graph independently samples order log n colors from one through delta plus one, okay? No coordination, no looking at the edges of the graph. Then with high probability, there is a valid coloring of your input graph where each vertex will be assigned only one of the order log n colors that it samples. And that's it. So it means you can sparsify um, the input, uh, the, the coloring palette, which initially for each vertex is of size delta plus one. You can reduce it to order log n colors and still find a coloring. And, uh, and the key thing here is that the, this uh, sparsification is done in a manner that's oblivious to the structure of your input graph. Okay, you're not looking at anything in your input. Okay, so here is just a simple illustration. You have a graph where delta is five, so the coloring palette is uh, of uh, six colors, and palette sparsification theorem says, let's reduce the coloring palette down to order log n colors, so it's two in this example, and then if all goes well, um, as the theorem predicts, you find a coloring which, uh, where every vertex is confined to using only one of its uh, sampled colors, okay? Okay, so that's the palette sparsification theorem, and that's at the heart of these algorithms. So let's see, how does this, uh, you know, reduction of palette help us design these sublinear algorithms? So let me start by just giving a simple meta-algorithm now for delta plus one coloring. So the input to the meta-algorithm is your original graph G with maximum degree delta, and its output is going to be a new graph uh, on the same vertex set, but with uh, somewhat reduced uh, set of edges uh, chosen from the original graph, and this new graph I'm going to call the conflict graph. So let's see, how do I create this conflict graph? So first, every vertex will sample theta log n colors as the palette sparsification theorem demands. And so for a vertex V, L of V will denote the set of colors that it has sampled. And now for every edge UV in the graph, in your original graph, if the color sampled at U and color sampled at V intersect, I'm going to add it to the conflict graph. Otherwise, I'm going to discard this edge. And at the end, I'm going to get this uh, uh, new graph, the conflict graph, and we are just going to go ahead and find a proper list coloring of this conflict graph, okay? Where each vertex will only use edges, uh, colors which it had sampled. Okay, so it's clear from the construction that any valid list coloring of the conflict graph, um, if it exists, is also a valid coloring of the input graph. And the palette sparsification theorem says, well, the coloring is going to exist with high probability. Okay. So we have reduced the problem of delta plus one coloring of our original graph 
into problem of list coloring this new graph the conflict graph. Okay. And the construction of this graph was non adaptive I just was able to make a decision for each edge independent of you know what the rest of the graph looked like. Okay, fine. So, I have transformed my original problem into another problem, but what have I gained in this process? Well, what we have gained is that this new graph is very sparse. So, if you fix an edge uv, it is an easy calculation to, to see that the probability that the edge uv will get added to the conflict graph is bounded by log square n over delta. Okay. If u samples a color, the probability v ends up sampling the same color is roughly log n over delta. Okay. And u samples log n colors, so the probability n edge uv makes it itself into the conflict graph is bounded by order log square n over delta. But how many graphs uh, edges do you have? Well, the maximum degree is delta, so it is order n delta edges. So, the total size of the conflict graph is n poly log n edges. Okay. So, the pallet sparsification theorem says that you can basically non adaptively sparsify your original graph with n delta edges to a graph with n poly log n edges while preserving you know delta plus 1 colorability with high probability. Okay, so how does it help us in these three models of computation? So, let us start um, with the simplest application which is the streaming model where it is immediate now. Okay. So, at the start of the stream every vertex will sample theta log n color and then as an edge uv arrives in the stream then uh, you are going to uh, check for this uh, edge uv if the color sampled at u and v intersect if they do you add it to the conflict graph otherwise you say forget about this set I do not need to know it. Okay. And so, you only need space um, to store this conflict graph and at the end you are just going to color the conflict graph okay, you, you using the sampled colors at each vertex. So, easy to see that um, the total space we have used in the process is n poly log n. You needed the space to remember the colors at each vertex plus space to remember edges of the conflict graph which is n poly log n. Okay. And as it turns out we can show that this conflict graph can also be maintained in a dynamic stream uh, with the same amount of space when you have edge insertions and deletions. Let us talk about this in the query model. Yeah. How do you finally discolor the reduced graph in positive? I will say something about it too uh, in a moment. Yeah. And um, um, uh, it can be done highly efficiently. Uh, there is an additional structure here which allows us to do it highly efficiently. But let me uh, come to it in a few moments. Okay. I sounded your question to my question. Okay. So, um, so, so let us talk about the query model. Um, where things are a bit more interesting um, in applying this uh, pallet sparsification result. So, what is the challenge in the query model? Why is it a bit more interesting? Well, in the streaming model you got to see every edge pass by and so you could take a decision about whether or not this edge belongs to the conflict graph. In the query model the whole point is you do not want to know about presence or absence of most of the edges in the graph that is how you are going to cut down on the number of queries. So, how do you decide which edges go into the conflict graph? Okay. Turns out to have uh, this uh, 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 you know challenge is only superficial turns out to have an easy solution and um, we are going to show that uh, if the maximum degree is delta uh, we can construct the conflict graph by performing only roughly order n square over delta queries. Okay. So, why is that? Let us look at um, uh, for each color c let us look at the set of vertices which sample this color c. Okay. 
So, so C ranges from 1 through delta plus 1, and X sub C is set of all the vertices which end up sampling the color C. Okay. And now, which edges uh, uh, do I really care to find out, right? What does the conflict graph contain? Well, the only edges of interest are edges which connect two vertices which have a common color. So the only edges I care to know about are the edges inside these sets, x1, x2, up to x sub delta plus 1. But each one of these sets has size roughly n log n over delta. I'm sampling colors with probability log n over delta. I can perform all pairwise queries inside these sets. That's roughly n square over delta square queries multiplied with delta when you get the bound on the total number of queries. And now, you know, this is not giving us immediately n to the 1.5, but you just balance it against the choice of delta. If delta is less than root n, I'm just going to run the good old greedy algorithm, and which is going to perform n delta queries, which is no more than uh, n root n. And if delta is more than root n, then I'm going to run this algorithm and recover the conflict graph. And uh, in the detail, I'm not yet talking about, and which got, uh, which Arvind also asked about, and I'll briefly talk about it uh, in a moment, um, is that uh, I'm only talking about queries, but in fact, it's going to give us an algorithm which will run in uh, same runtime. Okay? It's actually going to be even better the last part of it. Okay? So queries are the bottleneck. Okay, so let me just also super briefly mention um, the uh, algorithm uh, for in the MPC model. And then for simplicity, let me just assume that machines have, uh, uh, they share public randomness. So all machines have the same common source of randomness for now. Um, you can eliminate this assumption by just adding a couple of additional rounds. So what's the algorithm? Each machine will check which among its set of edges needs to go to the conflict graph, okay? All the machines have sampled from the same source of randomness, colors for the vertices, and now they just apply this test to edges in their input. And now I designate one of the machines as special machines. So all the machines send their edges uh, of which are going to go in the conflict graph to the special machine, and the special machine collects them and list colors the conflict graph, okay? And that's it, the total communication at the special machine is bounded by n polylog n because the list graph, the conflict graph has only n polylog n edges. Okay, so this is how the palette sparsification theorem helps. And let me um, say now a little bit about um, how does one prove um, the palette sparsification theorem, okay? So let's start with the, a warm-up exercise. And um, so you have a graph where I'm telling you the upper bound on the maximum degree is delta, but let's imagine uh, for now that uh, all vertices um, in the graph happen to be low degree vertices, okay? And by low degree mean the degree is bounded by delta over two, okay? Then we can do the following thought experiment. I'm going to do this experiment which will proceed in rounds. And in each round, each vertex which is yet uncolored is going to sample a color from one through delta plus one uniformly at random. And after sampling, an uncolored vertex will look at its neighborhood and see if this color is present in its neighborhood or not. If it's not, it's going to go ahead and color itself. Okay. And we're going to repeat this step until all vertices are colored. Okay. It's easy to see that um, since maximum degree is delta over two, 
In any round, a vertex has at least half probability of sampling a color, which is not going to conflict with anything in its neighborhood. And so after order log n rounds of this process, you will end up coloring the graph. But you didn't need to do this round by round, this sampling of colors. You could just sample order log n colors at each vertex up front okay, and open them one by one and pretend you're sampling them for each round. So this uh, proves palette sparsification theorem for us in this warm-up setting, okay? okay? Okay, so let's look at a more interesting example then. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now consider the other end of the spectrum where you have only high degree vertices and, uh, and in particular, let's imagine we have a clique on delta plus one vertices, okay? If you did the previous approach, you're going to end up needing omega delta rounds, right? Think about a vertex which is getting colored at the very end. There are delta colors present in its neighborhood. There is only a unique color that it can sample and succeed. The probability is going to sample that looks like one over delta. So you're going to need omega delta rounds and hence a palette of omega delta colors if you perform this experiment here. But <clears throat> we are not uh, in trouble yet, right? Um, this was only one way of using the sampled colors. We could use a strategy which has a better coordination among vertices and how they employ their sampled colors, okay? And in particular, the delta plus one coloring problem, we are going to view it here in the case of a dense graph as a matching problem. How? So here is the picture. On the left, I have the original graph that I want to color. And on the right, I'm going to construct a bipartite matching instance, okay? The left side of the bipartite graph are the vertices of the original graph. And the right side is the palette of delta plus one color, okay? So I have delta plus one vertices on the left and delta plus one uh, vertices on the right. Now, what is this uh, uh, graph originally? Well, originally in the delta plus one coloring problem, every vertex is allowed to choose any one of delta plus one color. This graph originally would be a complete bipartite graph. And what's a valid coloring solution? If any perfect matching in this graph is a valid coloring solution for a clique on delta plus one. So now let's think about what is it that the palette sparsification theorem is telling us. Each vertex on the left here is going to sample theta log n colors. So what it is saying is that, well, when in a n by n complete bipartite graph, when you sample edges at rate log n over n with high probability, you are still going to have a perfect matching. Okay? And that's a well-known fact. Okay, so this is uh, something we know. But this is already not uh, a one line of calculation. You have to do a little bit of work to prove it, okay? It's a standard fact, but this is what the palette sparsification theorem is saying. Now. So now we can start to see that there is a bit more challenge involved in proving the palette sparsification theorem because this is still a very special case. Let's look at, uh, so this is how the coloring would work. Um, let's look at, uh, uh, one more example to understand what's going on here. So take the clique on delta plus one vertices and remove from it a perfect matching. Okay? If you do that, then the maximum degree in the clique has gone down by one. It's now delta minus one. Okay? So this means delta plus one coloring now requires you to color it with delta colors. So now we have something interesting going on. When I look at the bipartite graph, on the left side I have delta plus one vertices, and on the right hand side I have delta vertices. In any valid coloring, I will therefore have to assign to some color more than one vertex, okay? So it's not anymore the standard matching problem, it's like a B matching problem, okay? And with some interesting constraints, um, so vertices on the right have bigger capacities, right? 
but the you have to make sure whenever you assign multiple vertices to the same color, those vertices better form an independent set. Okay, so that's the constraint version of this uh, B matching problem. Okay? So this is how the solution would look: yellow got assigned uh, two vertices, and so on. Okay, so the general case of uh, proving the palette sparsification theorem um, is uh, basically interpolating between these two views and uh, you know, uh, low degree vertices or sparsely connected vertices and, uh, uh, and then these densely con connected structures which I'm calling here uh, on this slide as almost click-like structures. And uh, so we need to interpolate between these two views and the challenge, all the challenging work is really happening in handling these dense structures which uh, you know, could look very different than just a perfect click where the problem is very clear. Okay? So the way we do it is um, by decomposing the graph into sparse and dense regions as these two approaches suggest. And, um, and in particular, um, we, these, these decompositions have been uh, studied in the context of coloring for a long time, uh, starting with the work of Reed. Um, the particular decomposition we used uh, in our work um, uh, was uh, motivated by a decomposition used by Harris, uh, Schneider, and Sue for distributed delta plus one coloring. Uh, we need to um, uh, somewhat m m modify this decomposition for our purpose. So here is the decomposition that we uh, use in, in our proving our palette sparsification theorem. Any graph um, can be decomposed into, uh, the vertices of any graph can be decomposed into two kinds of structures. Sparse vertices, which are going to be vertices where the neighborhood uh, will have omega delta square missing edges, okay? So it's a different definition than the one I gave uh, earlier where I said the, you know, the easy case was low degree vertices, but morally the same strategy, the greedy strategy would work even with these conditions, okay? And then there are almost click-like structures which are, you know, one plus minus epsilon delta vertices and, uh, uh, and not too many uh, for you know, vertices inside the click won't have too many missing edges, and also they won't have too many edges going out. Okay, but they will have edges going out, and they will have missing edges. That's where the challenge will come. Okay. So the plan then is to, you know, we find such a decomposition, we color the sparse vertices using the greedy strategy, and then we use this constraint B matching view to handle these almost click structures. Um, this, all this can be done in near linear time. And uh, the resulting, there's a matching problem uh, uh, hiding here, but uh, we don't even need to rely on the fast uh, new algorithms for bipartite matching. Uh, these graphs have some expansion properties, the other particular instances, and so we can rely on uh, uh, bipartite matching results which were originally de developed for expander graphs and showed that you can do solve problems on those graphs much faster. We can adapt and extend those arguments to work here, okay, and get near linear time algorithms. Okay, okay so I just had a small quick simulation to sh show you of the process, but I think in the interest of time, let me skip the simulation. Um, I think hopefully you understand the idea. And let me instead talk about, uh, spend a few minutes talking about uh, extensions of the palette sparsification theorem. There has been a lot of subsequent work, and, uh, and I will only touch upon uh, a tiny fraction of this uh, subsequent work, but, uh, but I want to highlight at least few interesting things which uh, have emerged in the subsequent work. Okay. okay, so we proved this palette sparsification theorem by sampling order log n colors at each vertex. You can ask the question, can I go down to order one colors, right? Can I just prove the same thing with order one color, okay? The answer is no, and uh, it's easy to show there are graphs where if you sample small of log n colors, then with the good probability, there is no feasible coloring among the sample colors of the input graph, okay? Okay, so that's small of log n. 
In fact, even if you allow yourself to sample log n color, um, it is not enough, uh, it is again not difficult to show, it is not enough to get a high probability of success if you just sampled log n colors. You need to be somewhat above the log n threshold. Okay. And we achieved this by some constant times log n, right. We did not talk about constants and, um, um, and, and I will keep it that way, I will not talk about the constants in our work. But you can ask the question, how small can that constant be made in front of log n? Very recently, literally like a couple of weeks ago, this got resolved right here um, uh, uh, by uh, Jeff Kahn's and Charles Kenny, um, who showed that um, in fact for any epsilon greater than zero, one plus epsilon times log n, sampling one plus epsilon times log n color is enough to get a high probability of success. So, so this is the asymptotically optimal version of palette sparsification theorem that has come about. Okay. Another extension, um, the delta plus, yeah. No, you need to be, so for every epsilon you will choose an n which is sufficiently large so that this event happens. Okay, so the delta plus 1 coloring uh, result, uh, the greedy algorithm for delta plus 1 coloring actually works for a somewhat more general problem of what is called the degree plus 1 coloring. And here every vertex is given a list of colors in the beginning which is its degree plus 1. And you can see the same greedy strategy would work when I want to color the vertex V, one of the colors in its list would be unused. Okay? So you could ask, can I solve this also by palette sparsification? And uh, uh, this, uh, shortly after our work, um, Sepper and Noga alone showed that uh, yes, the answer is yes, but um, only for the special case, they handled only the special case when the colors um, are 1, 2, 3 up to degree of V plus 1 at a vertex V of degree V. Okay? The general case is when these lists are arbitrary and that also got resolved recently. Okay? So the result holds. Okay? Okay, one more uh, thing that I want to talk about, maybe two more, I also have to answer the question about deterministic um, things. So you can ask, uh, you know, what is so special about delta plus 1 coloring? I had a graph which was delta plus 1 colorable. I sparsified its palettes and showed you can still uh, preserve delta plus 1 colorability. Can the same sparsification be done for other colorability threshold? What about delta colorability, right? And uh, all graphs other than uh, cliques and odd cycles are delta colorable. Can I do palette sparsification, prove it for those groups, right? Well, um, <clears throat> there are delta colorable graphs where um, unfortunately, unless you sample square root delta colors at each vertex, this palette sparsification theorem is not going to hold. Okay? And uh, what is uh, one such graph? Just take a clique on delta plus one vertices and take any two vertices u and v and remove an edge between them. Now it's delta colorable. U and V can be given the same color and you color the rest. But for the palette sparsification theorem to save you now, it better be that U and V had sampled a common color. And that is not going to happen unless they are each sampling omega root delta color. Okay? And notice that if you sample that many colors, then every edge is going into conflict graph. Conflict graph will contain all the edges you have, okay? So no sparsification is happening. Okay. Nonetheless, um, uh, Sepper and uh, Kumar and Mittal, they showed that um, it's possible to achieve at least the, uh, the performance we get for the streaming setting um, for delta colorable graphs, okay? And they 
the starting point is the Pallet's sparsification theorem, but then they handle all the failure cases, uh, all two to the 100 failure cases that arise. Uh, okay, it uh, suffers, suffers says the exponent is slightly off, but uh, um, that arise um, um, in the uh, um, failure cases that arise in direct application of the Pallet's sparsification theorem. Okay. Um, you can also ask about, uh, I said, you know, delta plus one coloring is one example of a tractable parameter. There are other parameters you can talk about. Uh, one of the parameters that has been studied since then is degeneracy parameter. Uh, degeneracy of a graph is kappa. If uh, for every subgraph of the, your original graph, you have the promise there will be a vertex of degree at most kappa, okay? So then you can kappa plus one color this graph by a greedy strategy. And uh, the work of uh, uh, Bera Chakrabarti and Pranther, who, who's uh, one of the organizers here, uh, shows uh, you know sublinear algorithm for coloring with kappa plus small o of kappa colors. Okay, kappa plus one coloring turns out to be hard to do. Okay. Okay. Before I conclude, I also want to answer your question about uh, deterministic algorithms. Okay. So the um, <clears throat> the in the context of streaming algorithm, yes. Does, does this use uh, a classification term? No, I think it uses a, a completely different approach to palette specification. Yes. There is a palette specification. No, there is a palette specification for in terms of degeneracy also. Okay, okay, uh, giving a tolerance of small o of kappa. Okay. So for deterministic algorithms. Uh, to get the same results in deterministically. Um, again, uh, work of Sepper um, and, uh, uh, and Glenson, and uh, I guess I'm not, okay. Um, they showed that um, in the streaming model, that's not possible. Uh, you're going to need way more than delta colors, okay? Unless you allow more passes, then you can bring down the number of colors, okay? But, um, in MPC model, the answer turns out to be yes. You can get a constant round algorithm deterministically. In the query model, the answer is again no. You would need omega and delta queries if, if you limit yourself to deterministic. Okay. So randomization is playing an important role for most of these results. Okay, okay I know I'm slightly uh, I'm over time, so just uh, let me finish quickly. Um, so we. Get, I showed you a non-adaptive uh, sparsification result for delta plus one coloring, and uh, which led to near optimal uh, sublinear algorithms on in streaming model, query model, and MPC model. And, and I just want to conclude by saying, uh, you know, um, two uh, uh, takeaways from, uh, you know, this work. One is that, um, you know, revisiting uh, classical problems uh, from the lens of sublinear computation sometimes ends up uh, you know, revealing some new insights into these classical problems, which is uh, how we felt about uh, this work, that we gained um, some new understanding of uh, delta plus one uh, coloring problem. And then, um, you know, usually going the route of sublinear algorithms means giving up on uh, exact nature of the solution that you see but every once in a while, you get lucky. You get to have uh, best of both worlds, and um, that's kind of what happened, I think, here. So with that, let me stop, and I'm happy to take any questions. That seems plausible. Yes, that seems plausible. Yeah, natural law. It's a natural law. Yes. So, so I guess the way you like set this up, like the, the greedy algorithm works for the square disease. 
do you know that the greedy <laughs> algorithm doesn't work after palette specification, or does greedy or maybe some like randomized version of greedy potentially work after you palette specify? Oh, so, uh, oh, no, yes, no, it does not because of the argument I made for the click like structure. You need to be coordinated. Okay, so, so think about like if I gave you um, uh, a random n by n graph with log n degree and you wanted to find a perfect matching in this graph, uh, just the greedy strategy is not going to work. You need some more coordination. Okay, and, and we have to deal with even more side constraints. Okay, so yeah. yeah. Sorry, log n plus? Oh, so, so log n plus small o of log n. So I, yeah, it, this is a good question. I think, I'm not sure that's going to be sufficient for vanishingly small probability of uh, success. I hope it will happen to me one more time. <laughs> um, I mean, so there was this other result, you know, where it happened. It, it, I, I've not really, you know, by which you, I, I don't know what you mean but of this kind of thing. I meant, I think what I'm thinking of is uh, getting an exact solution and uh, doing a really sublinear computation. And the same phenomena happened in uh, finding a perfect matching in a regular bar pattern graph and where there was an n log n time algorithm which could solve the problem. And, but it's not the most common occurrence. Normally you do have to give up on something. Other questions? Yeah, we can take more questions offline. So let's thank Benji. Thank you.